Well, praise the Lord, we're back with you again. And uh, we're just going to keep on sharing these wonderful nuggets from the Word of God and another discipleship empowerment word. And tonight we're going to look at the word reaping. And it's so important that we can understand this word reaping. And of course, most often when we look at the word reaping in the, word of the, in the scriptures, it's often t attached to the word sowing. Sowing and reaping, it's kind of a, a well-known phrase, but it's something that we're going to just focus on, mainly the idea of reaping tonight, that we need to be in the place that we reap those things that God wants us to reap. You know, God has planted so much in us and around us that He wants us to reap. He wants us to enjoy. He wants us to have. And that we need to go into the field and start reaping it. We need to know where the fields are, where God has planted things, and start reaping it. We need to see where the blessings of God are and then just go over and take take what God has given to us and wanting to show us. And so today we're going to be doing some interesting uh, journey as we look at this word reaping. And we're again, we're going to remind you that so often these words have to do with the physical sense and also with the emotional sense and the spiritual sense. And so, and it's been interesting how this particular topic, you know, I finished writing it this morning at, by a certain time, and it was just shortly after that I found out some other news. But we'll talk about that in a little bit later as we close in prayer. Our first look at scripture comes from the testimony of Moses, where he talks about giving a ceremonial law and moral law concerning the people of Israel. And it's interesting, here he talks about uh, the idea of to reap. And it's found in, in uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 9. It says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleamings of your harvest. And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor you gather every grape, of your vineyard ye shall leave them for the poor and the stranger i am the lord your god he says and it's interesting that it's this scripture that ruth picks up on when naomi tells to go over to boaz's farm and says to glean or to reap some of the crops that were there boaz was again very, very uh, responsible to the word of god to the law of god and so he would have left the corners in that and that's what naomi and ruth were reaping that's what they were taking in and it comes from this idea where that the lord wanted the people to leave some behind both for the poor so the poor could have something to eat but i also love it also for the stranger for those who were outside of the people of Israel, that they could have some food to eat too. And so God was thinking when he was even way back in, he was thinking and trying to get the people to, to realize that there's more than just themselves, but that they should be sowing not only for themselves, but allowing others to reap the benefits, what they have put into the ground. And it's interesting, it's only a few verses later where it talks about the neighbor and how they should react to the neighbor. Then as we move over into Job, Job talks a little bit about this idea of reaping too. In Job 4, verse 8, he says, Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. We have a little saying in uh, Thailand. I actually got a shirt with it on. It says, same, same. And what Job was trying to say, that if you're going to sow iniquity, you're going to also reap iniquity. If you're going to sow sin, you're going to reap the, the, the fruit that will come out of sin. You're going to sow trouble, you're going to get trouble. Sometimes call when and I say, you know, what comes around goes around. You know what I mean? And so we need to be careful what we are sowing. And Job is reminding the people, you know, if you plow your ground in iniquity, you're going to sow and reap trouble and the same. Then, we continue to move on and uh, over in psalm 126 verse 5 it's a very familiar one and i've quoted this one a couple of times and i must admit this is the one i was kind of experiencing this morning those who sow in tears 
shall reap and joy. And, you know, I had a, a very close brother in the Lord, and a fellow disciple, fellow theologian, passed away this morning. And I found out just after I finished this sermon. And I want to tell you, I did a lot of weeping this morning, because uh, we have wrote books together, me and him. We have done so many things together over the years. I've known him probably for more than 15 years, and I... And I, I, I want to say I'm, I'm glad he's home with the Lord today. But I sowed a lot of tears this morning. But I hope that they were tears of joy, of the great memories. And so God wants us to not only sow in tears, and we will sow in tears. Some of you are sowing in tears because of family members. Some of you are sowing in tears because of neighbors or those who are friends or those who are on the job site. You've sowed in tears. And I tend to be a little bit like a Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. I, uh, the, the fountain doesn't take much to get turned on in my life. That sometimes I will just be walking along and it will just start weeping. Weeping over different issues. But the Bible says if you sow in tears, you shall reap in joy. And I remember as I was weeping this morning, Colwyn said to me, he said, you know, there must be a great party going on in heaven. And I thought, well, why? Because, you know, Colwyn's dad's already up there. And my brother is also part of that same leadership team that goes way back to Colwyn's dad. And they're probably all together. You know, over the last few years, I've I've seen go home four of my closest friends from the Ketchin State. And it's not been easy, but they've all are together now reaping, not tears, but they're reaping joy. And we can be excited about that. Then over in Proverbs 22, verse 8, it says, He who sows in iniquity will reap sorrow, and the rod of his anger will fall and fail. So, if again, if you sow in iniquity, and the reason why the, these verses keep going back and forth, because there's, there's the two kinds of sowing. There is the sowing that reaps the blessings of the Lord. And then there's the sowing that reaps the destruction of the enemy. And we need to remember that. That Satan is trying to destroy and he wants us to sow into him. And to sow into his corruption. Not realizing that when we do that, we reap more of his destruction. You know, it's like quicksand. When you start sowing into the things of this world and into the things of the devil, it doesn't matter it doesn't seem to take long how long it is before it starts to swallow you up. Well, in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 13, he reminds the people again, the people who, uh, you know, the people of God who have showed have known better. He says, they have sown wheat. He says, they have sown wheat, but reaped thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but did not profit. But be shameful of your harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. See, isn't it interesting, Paul and Apollos, when Paul talks about Apollos, he says, some plant, others water. But who gives the increase? God does. And we need to remember that, that without God, we're going to get thorns. We're going to get hard, packed ground. We're not going to get the crop that God wants us to have because we're not sowing it in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Most High God. And the people of Israel discovered that because they were sowing things to the flesh. They were sowing things to this world and they were turning to idols and everything else. And because of that, they started to, to, to reap destruction and disaster and bondage and everything else. Well, Hosea goes on, and then he talks a little bit about this whole idea of sowing too. Sow for yourself righteousness, he says, and reap in mercy. Break up the fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. So it's time to break up this, the, the fallow ground and realize that God wants us to sow in and but what he wants us to sow is righteousness. When we sow righteousness, he says, we reap mercy. We reap forgiveness. And because we reap that, there is a great blessing in that. There's a great joy when we reap the fullness of what the Lord wants us to have. 
Then over in Micah 6.15, he goes on, he says, You shall sow, but not reap. You shall tread the olives, but not anoint yourself with oil. And make sweet mine, uh, wine, but not drink wine. He's saying, you know, you're going to do all these things, but because you have not walked in the righteousness of God, you're going to reap the punishment of fruitlessness, if there is such a word where you get nothing. You've done all that work, you've done all that planning, and you've done all the stuff, all the things according to the world. But instead of getting a harvest, you got a famine. And instead of getting a crop, you just got plants with no seeds on them. Trees with no grapes, or vines with no grapes on them. Trees with no olives on them. They're just, they're not there. They have all the image but they don't have the fruit. And a lot of times people are like that. We have tremendous image problem where we look like a, a field that is ripe, but there is no grain there. It's just plants. It's because we haven't sowed in righteousness. Because when you sow in righteousness, you shall reap again a harvest of righteousness, which leads to a harvest of peace and joy. He goes on, and as we move into the New Testament, it's interesting that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, he talks about this whole idea of sowing and reaping and the idea, don't worry. Don't worry. You know, I've been hearing and, and, and seeing on different things how people are in a terrible fit of worriedness right now around the world, worrying about this, worrying about all kinds of things and i can understand that worrying how they're going to pay their rent worrying how they're going to you know uh keep their businesses going i mean just worry and fear whether they're going to get sick and everything else all those kinds of fears and worry and in the midst of that it says here in matthew chapter 6 verse 26 he's talking about this idea of don't worry and he uses the illustration of birds he says, you know, kind of look out your window. Do you see the birds around you? Do you see the pigeons? Do you see the doves? Do you see the little sparrows? Do you see all of them? And they're probably all nodding their head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we see them. He says, I want to tell you something. He says, look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet the heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than them? What he was trying to say that if you walk in the Lord and trust in the Lord, God's going to look after you. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, it talks about, Oh Lord, give us this day our daily bread. And how does it continue on? And forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass again. See, when we keep a clean slate before the Lord, the Lord continues to provide. He continues to look after us and continues to allow us to bring in a harvest which will glorify Him. He says, So don't worry. Just relax. Don't sweat it. Have a look at the birds for a while. Some of you got some bird feeders out there. You know, God's used you to help them have food. <laughs> we got two birds here. I don't know, Colwyn, I think she talks to every animal on the face of the earth, and they all love her. And she's got two birds out there. They're named and everything, and she goes out in the porch every morning and lays bread out for them, and they're talking to her, and she's talking to them, and they're not worried. She's not worried. They don't fly away and everything. Like they're just, wow. And that's fulfilling the scripture. Because when you're in God, God will take care. And we don't need to worry. We don't need to fret. Then over in Matthew, again, Jesus, Matthew chapter 13, he talks about then that there's, there's these two kinds of seeds that are going on. And he talks about a parable, a parable of the sowing of the wheat and the tares. And the good crop was put in, and somehow, during the time of night, someone comes along and sows in tares to destroy the crop. At least that's what they think. And yes, that crop of tares is, is in there. And so the servants come along and said, do you want us to go out there? We see it. Should we go out there and pull it all up? And he said, no, just leave it. And when the crop is ready... Then we will go in and we will then harvest it and we will separate the tares first, pull them all out, deal with it, pile them up and burn them and then we will thrash 
the grain, for the time is a time of reaping. And the disciples didn't really get what was going on. That's what he was saying in verse 30. When he talks to them and gives this, he says, Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them and bundle them to burn them, but gather the wheat into the barns. And then, of course, the disciples needed some understanding. And what are you talking about, Lord? And he gives the interpretation of it in verse 39. It says, The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. There is a time that if things are not cleaned up and straightened around, that the harvesters are coming. And they are going to separate the sheep from the goats. They're going to separate the wheat from the tares. It will be a time. And there will be people who say, but Lord, we did this in your name. And he says, it doesn't matter because I don't know who you were. You're not the true wheat. You are actually a, an imitation. You're a tear. You know, you might look a lot like the same, but you are not the same. And you're not of my family and you're not of my garden. And when we send forth the harvesters, you got to be pure wheat, not some imitation thing. And so then he brings it in. Then Matthew 24, 25 verse 24, again we have this time another parable, but this parable is about the talents. Remember the three guys that were given talents and then the Lord was going to go away and he gave one guy so many talents and another guy so many talents. And then the third guy, he uh, takes his talent and of course he buries it in the ground. And so many people are like that. They're so afraid of losing the little that they have instead of giving it as an offering unto the Lord, give it, letting the Lord use it for his glory. They hide it. They bury it. And the interesting thing is that this one person says in verse 24, chapter 25, he says, Then he who had received the one talent came and said, This is what the guy said, something he knew already. Lord, I knew that you're a hard man, that you reap where you have not sown and you gather where you have not, or not scattered seeds. So he knew already that the Lord was a Lord who is one who gathers. And it's the same thing. The Lord wants to gather from us. He doesn't want to gather nothing. He wants us to bear fruit. So that why? So that as we can be like the first two, that when we then take it and use it for his glory, not only do we give back that which God has put into us, but we make double that. And not only that, those who didn't use theirs will be taken away from them and given to others. So you get like a double portion, a double blessing. And that's what God is all about, trying to pour out a double blessing. God wants us to reap. Then we go on over into John. And this is also, this scripture is not only in John, but several other of the Gospels, where Jesus is talking about the harvest. Now in this particular case, it's found in John chapter 4, starting at verse 36. And this is kind of in the in between part of the woman at the well. Jesus talks about the woman at the well and that. And then there's kind of a, a, a time when the woman goes back to the village and then, you know, things change and the whole village come out. And what happens? Jesus ends up reaping the whole village for the kingdom of God. But during that time, he's with the disciples. And he says, And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruits of eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For this is the saying is true. One sows and another reap. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. You know, I have this verse underlined and circled in my Bible. Why? Because almost, I can say, every day or for sure every week or for sure every month, we get to reap the blessings that what others have sown. You know, people, I, I, the, the printing press where we are, were started by an old couple that are now in their 90s. And because of their vision, we can now print things. Because of the vision of things that like, like uh, Judson and Ola Hansen and others who took time to sow and sow, you know, uh, Ola Hansen had three wives that died, children that died, 
terrible things that took him over 30 years to get the scriptures ready. And then by the time he was finished at the end of his life with his translating the scriptures and then gave it to the elders and the leaders of the church, it was just a small church. And then he went home and died. He didn't see the big harvest that is continuing on to this day. That from them, that in approximately 100 and what is it, 38, 39 years, 140 years, Cohen? In 140 years from the time, no, not quite, it's even less that from the time when he gave the scriptures. Would it be 140 years since the time around of the, there. Here around there, 140 years. So in 140 years when the scriptures were finished, there is now three quarters of a million Ketchum believers that are now part of the harvest that have been reaped where he was a laborer. That's why Jesus was saying, you know, some sow and others reap. And I'm getting and Colwyn and I are getting the blessing of reaping in so often so much that others have sown and reaped and now have blessed us by what they have done then we go over in first corinthians 9 11 it says if we have sown spiritual things for you it is a great thing if we also reap material things so paul is saying to the corinthian church you know don't don't be so stingy with what you have <laughs> well he's not quite saying it that but that's the way i'm interpreting it He's saying, you know, we have sown into your lives. We have, we, you know, we have sown spiritual things in your lives. And is it too much to ask that you would sow back into our lives? You know, when it comes to the body ministry, that's what it is, that there's body ministry. There's people that are gifted at working, gifted at making money, gifted at putting things together. And God is calling upon them to sow into others who are doing the spiritual side of things. We're not doing it as a bunch of individuals, but we're doing it corporately as a team. Colwyn and I are able to do what we do because a whole lot of people sow into this ministry. But because of what you sow into, we're able to sow into others. And it's a continuation of growth, of planting and reaping and planting and reaping. And that's how God uses the body ministry. And that's so exciting. And Paul is reminding the Gentile church or the Corinthian church about that. But then he goes on in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and says this. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And how sad that is. Sometimes we, some people just give the barest of barest to try to meet the law. Instead of realizing that if we give unto the Lord joyfully, because he goes on, he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. And that is a promise. And that's what we need to understand. God is in the business of sowing and reaping. And Paul knew that because he says again over in Galatians 6, verses 6 through to basically 7. We'll start, or 6 through to 8. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. Verse 8, for he who sows to his flesh will reap flesh and corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. We shall reap if we do not lose heart. Oh, how true this scripture is. This has been a scripture that I have just stood on and have enjoyed and it reaped many wonderful spiritual bless blessings from it. Because I know that when you put in, you can, you know, people need to understand you don't get something from nothing. You have to put in to be able to take out. And the more you put in, the more you take out. We're using computer programs all the time here, every day. And we're always constantly reminded the more we put in, the more we can get out. And it's the same thing. The more you invest in people, the more you can take out of people. And the more that God invests in us, the more that he will take and use us for his glory. You know, whatever you sow, you shall reap. Then over in James, you know, the cry of the reapers that we need to be able to, again, as we reap, that those who have been sown into, they need to allow the Holy Spirit to use them. And then over in Revelation, we got Revelation 14 verses 15 to 16 as our last verse. 
he says, And the angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thus thrust your sickle, and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. God is preparing a harvest season, and we need to be ready to be part of it. You know, we need to labor, and again, each one of us are laboring. I thank God we're working with a team of people all around the world. And I thank God that there's a team of people that we pray for, especially throughout Canada, that we're a team doing it together. We're planning a big farm. You know, some farmers have got 2,000 acres and 3,000 acres. We got thousands of acres that we're planting in. And God is blessing the seed and bringing forth a harvest constantly in various places over and over again. And we thank him for that. But we also need to be reaping spiritually because when we sow in, in spiritually, we will also reap spiritually. You know, and, and I think it's also important to take time to inspect the fields and the crops. Take time. You know, are we weeping, reaping? You know, I, I sometimes, when people kind of have the woes is me and they're always complaining about nothing ever happens in their life, maybe they're just in the wrong field. Maybe they got to go find the fields that are ready already, that are ripe, and then get in there with the combine and start bringing in the harvest. I believe there's a harvest around us, but sometimes we need to open our ears and open our our eyes to see and hear where the harvest is so that when we hear God calling we can go in and reap it for God's glory amen I believe that's what he wants us to do so you can only get out of what we put into it and so I encourage you I encourage you with this spiritual nugget today to start doing more spiritual planting so you can do a lot more spiritual reaping. And where you have sown spiritually. I want to tell you, those of us who've got kids and grandkids and that. We have sown spiritually into their lives. And according to the promises of God. There is a day coming where we will reap spiritually from those seeds. I'm claiming that. I'm claiming that whether it's in my lifetime or in a next life, when, when, when I pass on and they continue on, there will be a harvest because the God promises that whatever you sow, you will reap. And that's why I love praying and I pray for you and I pray for the, our supporters. I pray for our workers because we want to keep sowing into their lives because the more we sow into their lives, the more harvest we're seeing coming out. And that's what we need to be. Prayer warriors coming to the Lord, sowing into people's lives. Well, I want to close in prayer tonight. But I want to close in prayer just to mention, today has been a little bit of a challenge, both for Colwyn and I. She has had a fellow friend and teacher pass away today. I've also had a fellow friend. This is my brother here. You know, uh, Sagun. I used to just call him Sarah, which means teacher. We worked together on books. We worked together on writing materials and, and writing things about the people and writing things about God and theological materials. And he taught, he was the head theologian at the seminary. It's a huge seminary. But today he went home to be with the Lord. And uh, he, he wrote references in the front of my books and I wrote references in the front of his book. And we go back a long ways. And we go back a long ways in prayer. We always, every time we met, we tend to spend time praying one for another. And I had the opportunity just this, just around Christmas time. You can see here, this is my brother here. We were in, in Michina. Of course, we'd always get together. And we'd always pray together. And, you know, this morning around five, the Lord took him home to be with him. And then the other teacher, the Cohen's friend, I'm not sure what time it was during the day, but she went home to be with the Lord too. And she was also a teacher at MIT here in Rangoon in, in Myanmar. 
So today we're we're mourning the loss. We've we've sown some tears today. But we know we're going to come back and reap the joy of the Lord. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we just ask right now for these families. I pray for my brother Sarah, for his family, his children. Lord, I know that they will miss him, and I know that the community of believers are going to miss both him and, and our sister in the Lord too. But Lord, now they're together with you, celebrating, Lord, that they have been true sowers of your word. And now, Lord God, they're reaping everlasting life with you. And Lord, I pray your blessing upon their family. I pray your blessing upon uh, what you're going to do through these events and these times. And also that you would just walk with Colwyn and I. And I want to thank you, Lord, that for the people that have teamed up together with us. Lord, that together we're sowing and together we're reaping. And Lord, you're bringing in a harvest. And I thank you. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for having the opportunity to harvest where we have not labored. And Lord, I pray for the same other ones that are praying right now, that they too will harvest where they have not labored. And then, Lord, I want to pray one more time for those family members that are connected to us, Lord, that I believe that as we sow into them spiritually, we will come back again. And we'll reap a spiritual harvest. Because, Lord, you have made it so and you have commanded it. And I believe it will happen. So we just want to put all our family members into your hands this day. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Continue on sowing. And if you're sowing, continue on reaping for God's glory now. Amen. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye, and we love you.